we have an infinitely many uh, pgns coming in right okay so we have infinite flock of pgns that you know many 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 pgns are coming and now they want they have to sit in a finite number of cages finite number of pgn groups so suppose an infinite flock of pgns land on a finite number of pgn holes then some pgn hole must have infinite sub flock sitting inside right when if every one of the finite cages has finite many pgns then we know that there is only finite many pgns sitting in everywhere together right so therefore one of them must have infinite this is also obvious to us and but this is called infinite pgn hole principle now this can be used to prove some very amazing results okay for example you can use you now combinatorics right this kind of arguments to prove for example uh, you know uh, theorem from analysis so let us look at some some examples okay so if uh, uh, some of these concepts are little difficult for uh, non math students you know they can really uh, just browse through it and we don't without looking at past details but it will be still inter interesting and instructive uh, to see you know how this kind of a method can be applied but the, i think the first part definitely uh, is useful for everybody and then uh, i will end up with one question which will i will not prove here and i will ask uh, any math student uh, who may be looking at this course uh, to go through it and try to prove it themselves <coughs> so we start with a, a very famous theorem called bolzano weierstrass theorem so what does the bolzano weierstrass theorem say it says that every infinite bounded subset m of the real numbers r has at least one limit point in r Okay. Every infinite bounded subset M of the real numbers has at least one limit point. Now, maybe you know you are not math, you will not know what is bounded and what is limit point. They are very simple. I am going to explain. So, a set is bounded if you can find some, let us say, a positive integer M, okay, some natural number M, such that the absolute value of any element of the set m that we are looking at is strictly less than this uh, number that we consider okay so there is some natural number small m such that the absolute value of x is strictly less than m for every element x of m okay so whenever x is an element of m absolute value is strictly less than m so in some sense it is saying that you know uh, it is saying that uh, uh let's say it's, yeah. it's saying that you know you have like this uh you know real line then there is some number plus m and minus m right so the set m that we are considering is going to be sitting inside this interval right that is what we are saying that you know the elements of the set m infinite set what we are looking at is going to be all within within this range so that is what is boundedness okay that is always inside this minus m to plus m so the absolute value is strictly less than smaller now the set m uh, you know contains uh, uh not contains like the set m has a limit point let's say p in the real numbers are or p uh, some element p is a limit point of uh, m if for every epsilon greater than 0 the interval p minus epsilon and p plus epsilon contains infinitely many points of m. so like what we were looking and maybe i shouldn't have raised it so let's say that some point p we are looking at okay p0 minus m plus m etc so this p is a limit point of the set m that we are looking at if uh, you now look at this interval okay where this length is alpha this length is also alpha right so p minus alpha this is p minus alpha and this is p plus alpha so this interval p minus alpha p plus alpha where alpha is any real number okay that interval contains infinitely many points of m, right the number of points of m that belongs to the interval must be infinite in that case we say 
P is a limit point. Now alpha can be made as small as you want. Right? For every epsilon uh, greater than zero, this is two. So if I give you epsilon is one by ten raised to hundred thousand, then you should still be able to find infinitely many points of m inside. So what the bolzano vesta theorem says is that if the infinite set is bounded, then it has at least one limit point in R. Okay, you can always find some uh, element whose boundary contains infinitely many points for every uh, small enough, uh, you know, every, every not small enough, every uh, interval, right? As, uh, any uh, as small as you want. Now, <clears throat> so the proof of bolzano vesta theorem by using infinite p general principle. So what are the pgns? Well, points of m are the pgns. That is easy to see, right? Because, I mean, easy to imagine, not see. Uh, because we know that for infinite pgn principle, we need infinitely many pgns. And uh, right, infinite block of pgns we want. And then, uh, yeah. And then uh, uh, we need to find some pgn holes, of course, which are finitely many in number. Right, finite number of pgn holes but since we already have this infinite set m points of m are the pgns now what are the pgn holes okay so the pgn holes we are going to define the pgn holes as the intervals because what we really wanted to show that uh, that there is a limit point says that some interval contains infinitely many points right so basically, the pigeon hole principle, when we apply, is going to tell us, you know, some interval contains infinite many points, and uh, that is what we precisely want, right? For any epsilon, we need this, but this is what we want. So therefore, we look at the interval. So you look at the uh, use the fact that the set M is bounded. So therefore, we can find this minus M and uh, plus M such that uh, the values of uh, or the points of m are strictly between the intervals minus m and m, right? So every element are now going to be present inside this interval, right? Now, minus m to m, there are finitely many intervals, right? Minus m, minus m plus 1, minus m plus 1 to minus m plus 2, etc. Minus 1, 0, 0 to 1, etc. m minus 1 to m. So there is at most 2m intervals here, and you take the 2m intervals, then we know that uh, because they are finite, by pigeon hole principle, there must be some uh, interval which contains infinitely many points of m. Okay. So let us consider some interval, let's say 4, 5 contains infinitely many. There could be several, of course, several intervals contains infinitely many. If there are more than one, you pick one of them arbitrarily. Okay. So we found out 4, 5 contains infinitely many, let's say. So then what we do? Then, uh, from this we selected for 5, it contains infinitely many. Okay. So now what I am going to say is that my number is going to be, uh, the, the limit point that I am going to define is going to be 4 point something. Okay. Then what I do is that, because 4, 5 contains infinitely many, I take the interval 4, 5, and then divide it into 10 sub interpreters, like 4.1, 4 4.2, etc., 4.9, and 5. So take this 10 sub intervals again, since there are infinitely many in this interval, we can, we know that, you know, there are infinitely many here and there are only 10 finitely many pgn holes. So therefore, some interval must contain again infinitely many points. Whichever interval, maybe more than one, you select one of them at random. Then this interval definitely contains infinitely many points. So I'll say that now the limit point is going to start with x equal to 4.2. Then take 2, 3, again subdivide. I will get something maybe the 7, 8 interval. So I will select 7. Then uh, I will take the 7, 8 interval and say that, okay, 1, 2 will have this. So I will take the next digit as 1. Then in 1, 2 will contain, you know, 1.89 may contain infinitely many. So I will take this. So this way I keep on doing. I can apply it as many times as 1 like depending on the accuracy, right? Whatever epsilon you give, I do it as many times, and then I show that I can continue to this. So this is, defines a real number, right? Maybe it doesn't stop, but still 
it defines a real number and uh, you know by the decimal expansion and then uh, the number is a limit point so we can uh, easily show that x is a limit point of m so i want you to think about y and show it yourself why precisely you can say that m is a, uh, the x that we have defined now is a limit point of m okay so this is the bolzano stress theorem now as a homework i want you to do the following theorem this is a generalization of bolzano stress theorem into no it this bolzano stress is on the real line now let us take the real plane right you have x axis and y axis so any bounded infinite subset m of r2 has at least one limit point in r2 right so you can find some uh some point in r2 with this property okay now what is the limit point in in r2 so in, uh, earlier we said that the interval you know p minus epsilon p plus epsilon now here you cannot say that but we will say that okay take the point p and then uh, you look at uh you look at uh, an in you know a, a disk around it okay this and with uh, radius epsilon okay so the epsilon disk around this i take and then say that this contains infinite limit points uh, of m for every epsilon greater than 0 you you make it even smaller right smaller and smaller doesn't matter you will still find infinite limit so this way you can define uh what is called a plane set theorem so this is again the generalization of bolzano stress to uh, dimension 2 so this is a homework for you now i want to finish up this uh, topic on uh, topic on uh, pigeon hole principle with a very very interesting application okay this is a very beautiful application uh, of some result that all of us have uh, known from the school time itself but we never most of us have never seen the proof of it and uh, you know this is uh, this well known result of uh, that you know we have seen that like you know if you take all uh, closed curves right like you know like triangles or uh, uh, squares or hexagons polygons or you know all kind of shapes with a fixed perimeter you know the length of the boundary is the same then out of which some particular figure has the largest area and we know that from the school time we know that it is a circle right circle maximizes the area and this is called the isoperimetric problem so isoperimetric problem says that among all closed figures of fixed perimeter p the circle has the maximum area or we call circle is a extremal figure okay now <clears throat> we all know this right but uh, how do we prove this so there has been uh, you know uh, you know this this result has been known for from thousands of years in fact they you know the they say that the greek people used to know this theorem isoperimetric problem and then uh, you know uh, everybody in this uh, you know like uh, last 2000 years you know like how probably heard about this but how many proofs were there very few in fact uh, proof uh, attempts were uh, also like probably few and one of the uh, persons who tried to prove it was uh, jacob steiner okay so jacob steiner came up with a proof and uh, uh, we are going to see this proof but the proof had a small gap inside okay? in fact it's a big gap but okay let us say a small gap uh and that gap uh you know was uh, pointed out by a german mathematician uh, i think i forgot his name sorry i will i will try to look it up later and then he pointed it out uh and then there had some argument you know one guy you know uh steiner said that okay that is not really required right you know but then finally like you know that person convinced him that it is required but we will first look at the shayne's beautiful argument which doesn't need any of the things that we looked at now you know something 
you can do from school time itself like or almost uh, you know something like that maybe a little bit of calculus in it but uh, you can still do it uh, and then we are going to uh, see uh, why that proof is not really complete and then how do you complete it and for that you can use p general principle again so the isoperimetric problem so what is the uh, Stain is proof. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to give only hints about this. I, I'm not going to really uh, do the entire proof. Uh, I want you to write down the proof. Okay. So what is uh, Stain's argument is following? Suppose you have, you know, like you are talking about this extremal figures. Suppose f is an extremal figure. Now, if f is extremal, then f is a convex figure. So what is a convex figure? So a figure is convex if uh, you know if I take any two points, uh, any two points, whichever two points you take, right? Then you take the straight line, line segment joining these two. The entire line must lie within that end, and the set. Right? So the set is convex, or the figure is convex if any two points that we take. You know, the line segment joining them must lie within entirely uh, that set. On the other hand, uh, you know, our polygons that we look at like this, you know, they are convex, right? Because you take any two points, no matter which two you take, the line joining is within that. On the other hand, a figure like this is not convex, right? Because I can take this point and this point, right? The line segment joining that is not inside the set, it's outside. So, this is not convex, this is convex. So, the claim is that if you are talking about extremal figures, it must be convex. Can you think of why? Okay, I want you to stop and think about it. Now, uh, suppose it is not convex, right? We are talking about figures with the same perimeter. You know, the length of the boundary is the same, right? Now, if the figure is not convex, I want you to show that you can uh, you can basically uh, you can basically increase the area without increasing the boundary. Okay, so show that. If the figure is not convex, you can increase the area without increasing the length of the boundary. So once you show that, the claim one holds, right? If f is extremal, then f must be convex. Now, now you take, uh, you know, take this boundary. Now the boundary, uh, you know, you pick one point, right? Now in the boundary, what you do is that you take, uh, you pick one point, and then uh, uh, what you do is that you you go along one uh, direction, right, and go exactly halfway through the perimeter. You know, perimeter is exactly half. That you can do, right? You just move along one side till you reach exactly half, and once you reach exactly half. Uh, what you do is that uh, you you select uh, uh, your second point. Okay, so these points let's say is A and B. I say that this A B the line the, the you take a line connecting this A B. Okay, this I call a cross cut. Now. <clears throat> uh, once you, you know, once you divide the perimeter into exactly two halves, the claim is that, uh, uh, you know, the areas must be equal also, right? So if you take such a cross cut, this is called a cross cut, then, uh, uh, you know, the area of this half and the area of this half, they are all, they are both equal. So every cross cut divides the area into two equal parts. Okay, now to basically, uh, you know, if strictly speaking, to say that, like, you know, you can always divide the perimeter into exactly two, you, you need a result, you know, from calculus that we study, 
known as intermediate value theorem okay we will not uh, we will not uh, go into detail there so intermediate value theorem says that if you if you i don't know whether i have written it here for you or i can just tell you uh, if you talk about uh, uh, maybe i have written somewhere yes uh, we will come we will come to that okay don't worry uh we will need some result yeah so so every cross cut divides the area into two equal parts okay so that is the claim two so try to prove this claim two uh again using the fact that if that is not the case you can still without increasing the boundary you can still increase the area now claim three this is the most important claim for a cross cut let's say ab right so ab basically divides the perimeter into exact half so i can just take half of it right because you know the other half has the same thing and same area also so i just take one half then now we take any third point let's say uh, c on the boundary okay so you have a b cross cut a and b are on the boundary then you take the point c now the angle acb is exactly 90 degree for any point c okay you take the point c here then this line segment right will also 90 you take this this will be 90 you take this this will be 90 right if you take this this must be 90 now why is this true can you prove that it must be 90 degree i want you to think about this uh, but uh, let me give you uh, some idea okay but oh, yeah you think about it sometime and then you listen to my idea then you try to finish the proof so here is the idea suppose uh, suppose not right so we have some uh, angle is let us say uh, so this is let us say ac then you have cb right right so this is ab so what i do is that i take this part ac so this acb so i have this ac line segment and uh, the cb line segment at this point c on the boundary i am going to put a put a hinge okay i am going to put a nail there then i will assume that you know this entire you know thing that we are looking at is made of like some thin paper uh, and then you have cut this part right and put this nail there so i have cut you no know, i have cut uh, this part out and this part out so i have this uh, you know uh, things right so these two things are there then what i do then uh, i will because there is this hinge i am going to take this piece of paper and i am going to rotate it i am going to rotate it in this angle or this angle now what happens when i rotate this well this area that we are looking at right this area is not going to change because i'm just taking this entire sheet right of paper the cut out paper part then moving it around right so this area does not change this area does not change and what happens to the boundary of the figure well the boundary also doesn't change right because in the boundary Uh, this length and this length is the same right i am not changing anything there so even if i rotate it like this the boundary still remains the same length now one once i do this what happen once i do this all that changes is the triangle in between right this ab and c this triangle changes because the angle between these two line segment changes of course the length of this and this doesn't change right so this length and this length doesn't change but the angle changes right when i rotate now suppose the angle between these two is theta and the length of this is let's say x and this is y so we know that the uh the the area of the triangle is determined by the length of this 
side, this side and the angle between those two sides, right, which is theta, sine of the angle between these two sides, right. So you have x, y sine theta and then half of that, that will give you the area of the triangle. Now, this area is maximized when theta is equal to 90 because sine theta is maximized when theta is equal to 90, okay. So if the, the angle must be equal to 90 for the, that area to be maximized. Now this tells that you know, if it is not 90, you can still maximize the entire area of the part that we are looking at. Right? So using that, one can complete this claim. Right? For cross cut AB and any other boundary point, the angle must be ACB for every point on the boundary. So this is the claim 3. Now what does this show? This shows that Nothing apart from circle can be an extremal figure. Okay, so this for this part I am using something which we have not really proved at this time. That like if you look at the the locus of the points, right, or the or the you know the the only figure where uh, you know it makes uh, uh, you know angle uh, ninety on every point with this with respect to this cross cut, right, on the on the boundary is uh, going to be the circle. Or, or you know the, the figure is disc and you know the boundary is a circle or semicircle. Now that result is something one can show without much difficulty, but it's not uh, not uh, necessary for our current argument. So let us uh, take it for granted that uh, such figures is the circle. So what this says is that nothing apart from circle can be an extremal figure. Now the the problem, right? So see, once you look at this, you might think that okay, the proof is already done, right? We have shown that, you know, you take the circle, you know, uh, circle is better than everything else, so right? That is the extremal figure, or at least it looks like. But the but the fact is that it it's not as simple as that, okay? Uh, it will be kind of difficult to convince of this, but uh, uh, let us look at some 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 weird analogy. Okay, like uh, uh, suppose suppose I you know suppose I ask you uh, the following question, right? Uh, that uh, that if you if you take let us say uh, if you take a uh, uh, if you take a needle, okay. So let me let me take a, a blank paper somewhere. Yeah. Suppose I take a needle. So a needle is basically a line segment without any without any width, right? Just a line segment of let's say unit length, whatever it is, right? Some unit, five centimeter, ten centimeter, one meter, one kilometer, it doesn't matter. Some units, one unit line segment. What I want to do is that I want to place this line segment uh, or in fact I want to rotate this line segment uh, in the plane, right? So, you know, we are sitting inside this plane and I want to rotate the line segment 360 degree. Now, what is the smallest area in which you can do this, right? What is the smallest area in the plane, right? So you want to find a set in the plane. In, in this set, I want to place this uh, line segment and rotate it. So I want to rotate the line segment in the plane. So by rotating, I mean that I want to start from this initial position. I want to slowly change it, you know. I can, you know, I am allowed to move it like, you know, left or right if you want, you know, I can just can shift it here, shift it here, right? So I shift it here a little bit and rotate it a little bit. Then I shift it again back and then rotate a little bit. That is okay. Right? Whichever way you want, you can. But you know, I want to slowly move this so that it covers every possible directions, right? So you know, the infinitely many directions, you know, uh, in this uh, uh, 360 degree, uh, this guy should be going through all those directions before it reaches back. 
So the 360 degree rotation must happen. Now, what is the smallest area of a figure in which you can do this? Of course, the obvious way is that you know you put a uh, you know like a needle here, right, and then rotate in this big circle, right? You can always do it. 360 degree you can rotate. And uh, what is the area that you require for this? That is 2 pi r, right? I mean, no, uh, well, pi r square, right? Pi r square is the area of the circle where uh, r is the, you know, it is unit, so it is basically pi, right? So within pi uh, area, whatever pi, uni, uh, you know, unit square, you can do this. Now, uh, well, of course, you can improve it further, you know, drastically. Instead of selecting this point, I select the midpoint, right? I can just rotate it here. You know, it's, this is the center. So then the radius divide, you know, divides by half, so it will be pi by 4. Okay, I mean, I should write pi by 4. Instead of pi, we started with big, beginning. I can reduce it to pi by 4, right? If you are really smart, okay, you can do, a, a, you know, even more different way. You can make it pi by 8. Oh, can you think about how to do this? Pi by 8. It's an interesting exercise, okay? Uh, now, but apart from that, now the question is that can you even reduce it further? So what is the minimum area in which you can do this? So people, you know, used to believe pi by eight is the best possible, and you know, and uh, many proofs were there, you know, many attempts were there to try to reduce it. Until one day, uh, a person called Besikovich, he came and uh, proved that there is no smallest area. What do I mean by there is no smallest area? When I say there is no smallest area, what I mean is that. You give me an area, right? Like, you know, I will say that 0 0.000001 unit square. I can give you a figure in which you can rotate this. You give me an even smaller area, 0 0.000000000001. Or like 1 raised to, and 1 into 10 raised to minus 20,000, right? No matter how small you give me, and no matter how large your your unit is going to be, like you know, this can be one light square, uh, light light year length, or one hundred kilometer in length. As far as you give me, uh, you know, a line segment of that length, I can give you a set in which you can do this rotation. So, which means that you can make the area go to as close to zero as you want. It, you can, of course, never reach zero, right? You cannot do rotation in a zero area. Uh, this thing. So therefore, it is never zero, but it can be as close to zero as you want. So which means that there is no minimum uh, area in which you can do this. So similarly, one question that one should really answer is that: Is there actually an extremal figure? Right. We said that nothing other than you know, nothing other than a circle can be extremal. But is there an extremal figure? If there is an extremal figure, we prove that, assuming that there is an extremal figure, right? This is all assuming there is an extremal figure, right? These arguments are assuming that, okay, suppose there is an extremal figure. If f is extremal, then f is convex, right? We assume that there is an extremal figure. Right? We said that if f is extremal, cross cut divides into equal parts. But maybe there is no extremal figure, right? Maybe these properties are there for circle, but still, that only says that, you know, all these properties must be there, right? But what is the guarantee that there is an extremal figure? Maybe there is no extremal figure, right? There is no largest area. You know, you can keep on, like, you know, <laughs> doing like this, right? Keep on making it small like that. You can keep on making it larger or something. We don't know. So, we need to prove that. And proving that requires another version of bolzano weschel theorem. So this is called bolzano weschel theorem for compact figures. I think I made the wrong choice. Yeah. So uh, for compact figures, uh, or BWCF. 
we say that any bounded sequence of compact figures has a converging subsequence. Okay? So this is for math students, other students need not really look into this, but just to thinking about it may be interesting, but other than that, uh, but math students uh, can look at this, should look at this. So any bounded sequence of compact figures has a converging subsequence. So what is a compact figure? So we already said what is uh, what is bounded, right? Now, if you have a set which is bounded, and we said what is a limit point. So, if all the limit point of a set belongs to that set itself, then it is called closed. Now, if you have a set which is also which is bounded as well as closed, then it is compact. Okay. Now, if you have uh, a set S uh, and uh, I mean, uh, not uh, a set, S is a real number, which is the exact upper bound of areas of all figures with perimeter P, okay? Suppose. So, uh, okay, sorry, I, I, I didn't mention this. So, suppose we proved bolzano weschel theorem, right? Any bounded sequence of compact figures has a converging subsequence. Once you have this property, we can assume there is some uh, figure which is the exact upper bound of areas of all figures with perimeter p. This is by using a property of real numbers, existence of exact upper bound. I will mention what is exact upper bound and how to prove this. Uh, in fact, you can prove it using again p and whole principle if you want. Uh, but uh, yeah, assuming that this is done already, that we can we can say that uh, uh, S be the exact upper bound. Then for every natural number k we can find a figure mk with perimeter p and area greater than s minus 1 by k because s is exact upper bound in the neighborhood it should contain at least one point okay that's by the definition uh, and so therefore if the exact upper bound of all figures of perimeter p uh, the uh, s is the area then s minus 1 by k for any k you should be able to find some figure which is close to that that is a property of exact upper bound now, because the area is bounded and the perimeter is bounded, right, is fixed, these figures will form a bounded sequence of compact figures. And therefore, you can apply the uh, bolzano weschel theorem. So, therefore, it has a limit point. Now, if it has a limit point, the, the areas basically are keep on increasing to S. And S is, you know, you know this, this sequence of areas are converging to S. So if there is a limit point for this, that only possibility is S only. No, you cannot have a different uh, value as the area, uh, limit point of the areas. Okay, so these things one can, you know, math students can easily uh, figure out. Therefore, by the above theorem, if we have the above theorem, this is a limiting figure. So clearly the figure must have area S. So therefore, uh, by bolzano weschel theorem for compact figures, we can show that there is a limiting figure. And since we already know that the only possible limiting figure is circle, circle is the limiting figure. And therefore, we have a maximum there. And therefore, we have circle obtains the maximum area. Now, I want you to prove bolzano weschel theorem for compact figures. This is a result in analysis, of course, using the pgn hole principle, infinite form. So this is for just for math students. Other students are welcome to try if you want. You know, adventure students. But you need some concepts which uh, mostly only math students see. So here are the concepts needed to prove the uh, pigeon hole uh, using the pigeon hole principle to prove this. Okay. So one one is that uh, a set M subset of R is bounded non-empty. Then alpha belongs to R is an exact upper bound of M. If uh, First property, there is no larger uh, element in M, right? So X belongs to M, X is greater than alpha, there is no such X. So alpha is an upper bound basically for all the elements. So alpha is on the right hand side, right? Then the interval alpha minus epsilon comma alpha contains at least one limit point of M for every alpha. I mean for every epsilon, okay? So, uh, for every epsilon, uh, the interval alpha minus epsilon comma alpha contains at least one limit point. 
uh, at least one point of it, sorry, not limit. Okay, so there are, you know, as close as you want to go, there should be one point, again and again and again and again. Okay? Now, I'm saying that it is at least one point of M because, you know, this point of M may be, may be disconnected and sitting outside as a single point on the right hand point, right? That is still a, uh, a point with this property, right? It's an exact upper point. And uh, uh, you don't need infinitely many points for it to be an exact upper point. But still, you can show the existence of uh, an exact upper bound uh, using the uh, infinite PHP if you want. Then, second condition, if a continuous function, so again, I'm not going to define a continuous function formally here. My students already know that. Other students can assume that it is a, it's a you know, smooth growing function in the sense that, you know, there are no breaks, right, in the values, right? So basically, like, you know, if you start from a value, it keeps on smoothly increasing till reaches uh, another value. So if a continuous function over a connected set M attains, uh, uh, let's say, two values f of a and f of b, where f of a is strictly less than f of b, at uh, corresponding points a and b, and f of a and f of b contain some number y in between, then for any number, uh, let's say y, uh, you take in between then uh, you know uh, f of c is equal to y for some point c between the points a and b this is called the intermediate value theorem right? basically it says something like this so you have this uh, just, uh, yeah so you have this uh, let's say i'll take the blue. so you have let's say these two you know, axes, and then you have this continuous function, let's say. And then it attains some values, let's say, uh, f of a and uh, some value f of b. Now you take any number between f of a and f of b, right? Let's say y. Then there is some point c between this a and b that's that f of c is equal to y, right? This kind of obvious once you see it in a visual manner, but you need to prove it rigorously. This is called intermediate value theorem. Okay? Something one can show easily. And this is a result that you might require if you want to formally prove this. Uh, then, uh, given a compact figure f, the epsilon extension of f is obtained as the union of epsilon disks of all points of f. Okay, so here is uh, an example. So I take, uh, I take, let's say, some, you know, compact figure. Then, what I do is that, you know, fixing some epsilon, I will say that, okay, I take an epsilon circle, right, epsilon disk, not circle, right, epsilon disk around each point of the set, every point, I'm going to keep an epsilon disk, right? Then this, right? This uh, union of this epsilon disk gives me another set. Okay. This is called the epsilon extension of, let's say, the figure F. Uh, the figure f okay so we have the epsilon extension of the figure f now once you have epsilon extension i can define the distance between two figures like right? you know, what is the distance between two figures like right? you can okay? so the distance uh, is defined as follows you take the epsilon extension of f and suppose you have another figure, let's say G, right? Another compact figure G. And the distance between F and G is you take the epsilon extension of F and define the smallest epsilon such that you can put G inside F. Okay? But you want your epsilon to be such that if you take epsilon extension of G, 
you should be able to put f also inside g and the extension so the smallest epsilon such that epsilon extension of f1 contains f2 and f2 epsilon extension of f2 contains f1 that is called the distance between the compact figures f1 and f2 okay so this is uh, uh, these are the uh, you know these are the uh, points or notions that you might require to really uh, formally prove the bolzano weierstrass theorem for compact figures and again using the infinite pgn for principle okay so try to prove this and then that will tell you you know uh, there is an you know extremal figure for the isoperimetric problem then we will prove that uh, circle has a maximum area among all these figures so i think uh, that would be a very nice question because you know it's a very classic question that uh, all of us have studied in school and uh, probably not seen a proof of it before so try to look at this and try to prove this so i think we we finish all the topics that we wanted to cover in pgn hole principle and then uh, you know there are many 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 questions that you should solve right in the textbook uh, that you have the provaldis book and uh, using this uh, uh, you now you will get more experience in solving okay so with that uh, uh, we stop for uh, today and then we will continue in the next class